When I was a kid, my dream was to make movies one day. And a lot of people just kind of blew it off and called me a dreamer. Elon Musk had the dream of making the human race a multi-planetary species. Which is almost as hard as making movies. And this week, he announced how he plans to make that dream a reality. And a lot sooner than you think. Anybody who knows me knows that I am an Elon Musk fanboy. I think everything he touches is awesome. So when they announced that he was going to reveal SpaceX's plans on how to get to Mars, I tuned in. The Musk haters out there, more like Musk rats, am I right, are going to be quick to point out that this announcement conveniently followed a disaster on September 1st when their Falcon 9 rocket exploded on the pad, destroying a satellite that was being launched by Facebook. And can I just pause for a second and think about the fact that Facebook is launching satellites? Okay, moving on. And while the timing may be convenient, colonizing Mars is something that's been in Elon Musk's mind for a very long time now. In fact, he's said multiple times that the whole reason he made SpaceX was to make the human race a multi-planetary species. His reasoning is that as long as we're all on one planet, there is no plan B. And if some extinction level event were to occur, which has happened six times throughout Earth's history, we'd be screwed. He likens it to backing up a hard drive, you know, just in case a giant meteor were to slam into your computer. So he's not interested in landing on Mars and planting a flag. He's going for full-on colonization. In fact, he said there will be no Neil Armstrong of Mars because his first ship that goes out there is going to carry something like 100 people. It'd be more like the early explorers traveling over to the New World. This would not be a quick trip. His ultimate goal is to get a million people living on Mars because only then would you have a self-sustaining civilization. And he estimated that would take like 10,000 trips. And how does he plan to get 100 people to Mars on one fell swoop? The Interplanetary Transport System. Let's talk about this rocket, shall we? The Interplanetary Transport System, which I will from now on call ITS because holy crap syllables, would easily be the biggest spaceship ever built. I mean, by far. It consists of three parts. The booster, the crew cargo ship, and the refueling ship. And you're gonna just have to forgive me for my use of superlatism describing this ship because everything about this thing is insane. First of all, almost all rockets are multi-stage, meaning there's a first stage rocket that gets the, the rocket out of the atmosphere when a second stage takes over and so on and so on, each stage being a little bit weaker than the previous one. A Saturn V rocket that took us to the moon, for example, had three stages. The ITS has two stages, and the second stage, the weaker stage, would still be more powerful than any currently used rocket on Earth. So powerful, in fact, that Musk plans to cut the six-month trip to Mars down to three. The booster stage is enormous. It has 42 engines, and not just any engines, SpaceX's brand new Raptor engines. The engine SpaceX currently uses is called the Merlin engine, which is kerosene-based. The Raptor one is actually oxygen and methane-based for reasons that I'll explain later. It's three times more powerful than a Merlin engine. In fact, one Raptor engine can launch a 747 into space. And this thing has 42 of them. The booster will also follow the lead of the Falcon 9 rocket by returning to the launch pad and landing vertically. The crew capsule is designed to hold up to 100 people, though he said in later missions they may push it up to 200 or 300. Remember, his goal is to colonize Mars, not just visit. He didn't really have any renderings of the inside of the capsule other than this epic sci-fi picture, but he did say in an interview that it would be luxurious and have all kinds of amenities like a movie theater and a restaurant. He compared it more to a cruise ship. And the third segment is just a refueling ship, and it uses the exact same design as the crew cargo ship, only it's just filled with fuel for reasons that I'll explain why in a second. But back to that crew capsule for a second. What? I have to admit, I'm a little confused as to how he says he's gonna fit 100 people into this and make it as comfortable as a cruise ship. I did a little math, and if each person only had seven cubic feet of space, which isn't even enough to stretch out your arms without it bumping into the ceiling, that would take up 34,000 cubic feet, which is more than the ISS has and it's as long as a football field and only has six people in it. Wait But Why put this picture together to show how long the whole ship is, and as you can see, the crew cargo capsule only takes up just a small corner of the end zone. So you're gonna have 100 people living there for three months comfortably? And actually, it's way longer than that because it's not like you can just walk off the ship when you get to Mars and check into the Hilton. They're gonna have to build their structures there or dig underground or however it is they're gonna colonize this place. They're gonna be living on this ship for quite some time. So I'm having a little trouble with that. I'm just being honest, but I don't know. We'll see. Anyway, so here's how this bad boy works. The booster and its 42 insanely powerful rockets launches the cruise ship into orbit and then comes back down to Earth, landing at the launch pad. 
By the way, Elon Musk chose pad 39A at Cape Canaveral, which is also the same launch pad where they lifted off for Apollo 11. He says he uses that because it's the biggest launch pad in the world, which is true, but I'm sure there's a little bit of Musk trademark showmanship at play here too. Once back on a launch pad, they load the booster with a fuel tank while refueling the booster itself. Then it takes off again. I'm not sure how long this should take, but from the video, it looks like less than a day. The fuel tank then docks with a cruise ship and fills it up with fuel before returning back to Earth. Then the cruise ship departs for Mars. Once it gets up to cruising speed, roughly 62,000 miles per hour, it deploys solar arrays to power the vehicle. Then three months later, they arrive at Mars, burn through the Martian atmosphere, just like traditional probes, and then land upright. And so begins the first human colonization of another planet. What happens after that though, well, we don't, we don't know. Because you might be asking, how do they get off the planet? Are they gonna carry enough fuel there for them to get back? Nope. This doesn't mean they're stuck there forever. The plan is that they'll make their own fuel right there on Mars. Yeah. Remember how I said the Raptor engine is powered by methane and oxygen? Well, this is why. Because once they get there, they're gonna make methane out of frozen hydrates in the soil. In other words, the very first thing we're gonna do once we land on another planet is start drilling. Awesome. Methane can also be made using water, ice, and CO2 that's in the Martian atmosphere. It's both very plentiful there, so there's that too. Now, if this all sounds a little crazy, just wait till you hear the timeline that he wants to do this in. Due to the orbits of Mars and Earth, the only time that you can really go from one to the other is during what's called the Mars opposition. That's when Mars and Earth are closest to each other, and this happens about once every 18 months. And we're kind of at opposition right now, so the next chance to go would be in 2018, which is exactly what Elon Musk wants to do. The plan is to fly an unmanned dragging capsule with cargo to land on Mars on July of 2018. The Dragon is the craft that SpaceX currently uses to resupply the ISS. In October of 2020, they'll follow that up with multiple Dragon spaceships filled with cargo, so the first settlers will have a lot of food and supplies when they get there. In December of 2022, they'll fly their first mission to Mars with the ITS unmanned, but with more cargo. And in January of 2025, the first manned mission to Mars on the ITS. We could be landing on Mars in nine years. This is insane. I wanna go. Musk did say that the first missions to Mars will be extremely dangerous, and one of the prerequisites for anybody to go will be, quote, a willingness to die. I don't want to go. Musk actually downplayed the risks of things like cosmic rays, both on the trip out there and once they land on Mars, but I have to say, I think it's actually a much bigger deal than he lets on, even after we land on Mars, because we don't have that protective electromagnetic field like we do here on Earth to, to protect them. And the atmosphere on Mars is much smaller, much shallower, and, 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 and not as dense as the one here on Earth. So I actually think it's kind of a big deal. But this also speaks to what, in my mind anyway, is the biggest thing about going to Mars, which is something that was just barely hinted at in his presentation. Behind Musk for the entire presentation was this slowly spinning image of Mars, which transformed throughout the hour and a half that he spoke from this to this. And this was the final shot of the promotional video that showed how the ITS would work. The dude wants to terraform Mars. Which, let's face it, there's no reason for us to go there and colonize the place if it's not a place where we can actually live. So how would he do this? He didn't say anything about it in the presentation, but he has in the past talked about it, like in this interview with Stephen Colbert, where he revealed his plan, which was, uh, Characteristically Muskian. The fast way is, is drop thermonuclear weapons over the poles. You're a super villain. <laughs> yeah, he wants to nuke the poles. Actually, he wants to continuously nuke the pole with what he called two tiny suns in order to melt all the frozen CO2 in the Martian ice caps. Now, I'll be honest, I'm not sure exactly what this is supposed to do because the Mars atmosphere is already like 94% CO2. So I don't think it's about putting more greenhouse gases into the atmosphere as much as it is just maybe thickening the atmosphere a little bit. But again, that's kind of a losing battle because without that electromagnetic shield that we have, solar radiation picks off and thins out the atmosphere over time. So I don't know. Now there's actually a lot of options when it comes to terraforming. All of them are just mind-numbingly difficult, but I'll point you to this Isaac Arthur video that will explain all the options in great detail. Of course, if we have the power to terraform another planet, we might could put that same energy toward fixing our own. I'm just saying. And finally, I just want to leave you with one other thought. Let's just say this works. And in 50 years, there's thousands of people living on Mars, not just from SpaceX, but other companies as well, sending people out there. What kind of culture would that be? What sets of laws would this place follow? 
what nationality would it be? Would it be completely self-governing and self-contained? Would you need a passport to go there? Would it by necessity be more of a communal socialist culture where everybody has to chip in? Everything about this place and its environment would be completely different from back home. And there'd be a communication gap of at least 30 minutes to send messages back and forth uh, because it takes that long for the messages to get to Earth and back that I think it's easy to see that the culture would diverge from that of planet Earth and probably pretty quickly. Perhaps the closest example of this that we can find right now is the South Pole. There are people living there that are completely cut off from the rest of the world for the most part, although they can still communicate pretty easily. But uh, even the South Pole is divided up into sections that are controlled by different countries. But would this be connected to countries at all? Because they'd be flying there at the behest of a corporation. They would be paying their tickets to a corporation to go there. So who would own this? Who would run it? Like always, the most intriguing questions, for me anyway, are the human ones. But I really want to hear what you guys think. Do you think Elon Musk is totally off the mark on some of this stuff? Do you think he's not thinking it all the way through? Do you think he'll be able to make this timeline? Is this something you would want to do? Would you go to Mars? Links to articles and stories about this are down in the description. Thank you guys for watching. If this is your first time here, I really hope I earned a subscribe because I come back with stuff just like this every Monday. And if you're here for the first time or not, please give it a thumbs up, share it with your friends because this helps this message travel to further places and reach more people. I'll say that better in future videos. And a special thanks as always to the people on Patreon who help support this channel and make this possible. If you'd like to support it, go to patreon.com slash answers with Joe. I'm going to leave you with this for now. Thank you guys so much. Have an eye-opening week, and I'll see you next time. Love you guys. Take care.